Now I'd like to turn to the conventions used to name peaks and components. In many cases, people use the same name for the observed peak and the underlying component, which muddies the distinction between peaks and components. The most common convention is to label the peaks with a P or N to indicate positive or negative, followed by a number, like the P3 wave shown here. In some cases, the number indicates the ordinal position in the waveform. For example, P1, P2, and P3 are the first, second, and third major positive components. In other cases, the number indicates the latency in milliseconds. For example, the visual N1 often peaks around 170 milliseconds, so it would be called N170. If the number is less than 5, you can assume it's the ordinal position. If it's greater than 5, you can assume it's the latency in milliseconds. The P or N doesn't indicate whether the voltage is positive or negative per se. For example, the voltage for this N2 wave is on the positive side of the zero line. Instead, the P or N indicates whether the peak is heading in a positive or negative direction. The N2 here is negative going, so we give it an N. The idea is that there's actually a negative component in the brain, but the voltage from this component is superimposed on positive voltages from other components at this particular electrode site, so the scalp voltage never quite becomes negative. This naming convention might seem straightforward, but it can get pretty complicated and confusing. As I mentioned before, the relationship between the timing of the underlying component and the timing of the observed peak can be pretty complicated. And there are way more underlying components than visible peaks. In fact, a given component might not have a single distinct peak. Also, every component produces a positive voltage over one side of the head and a negative voltage over the other side. We might not have electrodes covering enough of the head to see both sides of the dipole, but both the positive and negative sides of a component are present somewhere on the head. So a component could be a P1 at one electrode and an N1 at another. We don't even use P or N for the very first visual response, which comes from primary visual cortex. We call this response C1 because it can be either positive or negative, depending on whether the stimulus is presented above or below the point of fixation. This is because primary visual cortex is folded up in the calcarine fissure, and the upper and lower visual fields project to opposite sides of the fissure. This flips the polarity of the dipole for stimuli in the lower field relative to stimuli in the upper field, giving us opposite C1 polarities at our scalp electrode. The number in a component label can also be confusing. The P3 wave is often called P300 because it peaked at around 300 milliseconds in the first study where it was observed but it can peak as late as 600 milliseconds in some experiments. And yet it's often called P300 under the assumption that it's the same brain process, but occurs at different times depending on the difficulty of the task. You should also know that some components are modality specific and others are modality independent. For example, the visual N1 is completely unrelated to the auditory N1, but you get the same P3 wave for both auditory and visual stimuli. The bottom line is that the nomenclature for naming peaks is a bit of a mess. It's kind of like the English language, where a given word can have multiple meanings, and different words can have the same meaning. We deal with this kind of ambiguity in natural language comprehension by using the context to figure out what a word means. And once you become fluent in the language of ERPs, you'll also be able to use the context to know what somebody means when they refer to a component like P600. In the meantime, try not to read too much into the label that somebody uses for an ERP component. The fact that two different papers refer to the N1 wave doesn't mean that they're actually talking about the same component.